If I ask you, what's your favorite piece of Souls-related artwork, something will probably come to mind. Maybe it tells a story, or maybe it took a lot of technical skill to create. Maybe it's a picture of Siegmeier as a banana. It doesn't matter. My point is that art can make you laugh. It can make you imagine and wonder. So let's marvel at some art and hear from the talented artists who create it. Dark Souls had already been out a year, I think. I know for me, it was a, a game that consumed my life. This is Carson of Carson Drew It. If you don't know Carson, chances are you at least know his work. His are the cute characters that appear on my Dark Souls Prepare to Cry videos, and he was the first artist I ever worked with. I went to work and all I could think about was Dark Souls. I would sit there and rather than actually do work, which is terrible to say, <laughs> I sat there looking up concept artwork and stuff, just being completely enamored with, with this property. This love of the game inspired creation, and it wasn't long until Carson had this small gallery of uncolored Dark Souls characters, as well as this growing fan base urging him to color them all in and make more. Carson allowed me to use some of his work in the thumbnails of my lore videos, and honestly, these simple, cute characters are probably a big part of why Prepare to Cry even became popular. I talk about commissioning and what it means to me with another artist, John Devlin. I get like a small sense of what the artist must feel, which is like I helped create something or I did create something and it didn't exist before and now hundreds of people can enjoy that, you know? Is that how you feel when you create a piece? Yeah, that's exactly it. Like, um, I mean, there's people I've gone through like, I think 50 to 60 emails with just for one picture. Like, we'll just go back and forth and back and forth and I don't mind that at all. Like, I mean, it's their picture, like, so I'm pretty fast at what I do, so um, I'm able to throw things together really quickly, and yeah, like I'm doing that constantly, so uh, I know exactly what you mean. This is John, who did the gorgeous commission for this video's thumbnail, actually. I love his work, and you can probably see why. It's really unique, isn't it? Every piece has this bold, angular, and compact look to it. It's like the center of the piece is tightly controlled, but the edges are chaotic and erratic in the way that they spiral out. It's a really distinct style. I think it is very, very important to have a distinct style because you'll always be sought after. And if, if like 20 other people are not even 20, like hundreds and thousands of other people can do your style, well, then you're not, you're not as unique and people won't come to you. And if you can uh, offer people to do a job for them and they can't find anyone else to do it, uh, I think that's a good thing to have if you're making a living as an illustrator. So it works out for me anyway. But. John's Souls-related work spans Dark Souls and Bloodborne. Most of it started during Inktober, an event where artists challenged themselves to create an ink drawing every day for 31 days. This is the picture he did on the first day. It's the Channeler from Dark Souls 1, one of John's favorite designs. He's written this message along with it that says, Tempted to make all of my images for the 31 days Dark Souls-related. And over 68 Souls-related pieces later, I'd say that those 31 days went pretty well. Um, in the space of a few days of finishing Inktober, I'd sold every single one of the pictures, and from selling them all, people who didn't get one were commissioning me to do their own pictures, and it just kept going and going, and it's still going even now. So I would say for sure, like when it when the Dark Souls community came about, like that was probably the most support I've seen. And everyone's been very friendly and. They also like exploring the lore and that kind of stuff, so... I first became aware of Solol back in 2013 when she entered the Dark Souls 2 shield design contest. Wyvern Wall features a Wyvern scales woven onto a great shield. Unwavering Gaze has this chilling eye covered with a bloodied hand, suggesting that it must have been some poor guy's last sight. And Solol explains the last shield here, which I found particularly interesting. The one I put in the most effort was divine intervention and it was like it was it was Nito, the furtive pygmy, uh, Gwen and the witch of Isleth. Um, so I represented all four of them like um, Gwen was symbolized with the dark sign and, and the chains as kind of forming a sun kind of feeling. Um, Nito were the skeleton hands that was grasping at the bonfire in the middle and the witch of Isleth had the little tree roots at the bottom. Um, 
And so I try to like combine all four, which is like the basis of Dark Souls 1, like into that shield. So looking at Solol's work, you really see the effort and thought put into every stroke. She paints digitally, so while you're watching one of her Twitch art streams, you'll see these pieces gain depth and detail on top of what was already looking pretty good. And if you're really lucky, you might even get to see her draw something like a cheeky little Nito under Nishandra's dress. For Twitch, that's like an interesting phenomenon because it's it's interacting with not only the chatters but directly with the streamer and you can take on feedback and integrate it just to entertain them. Um, I just drew Nito under there because I thought it was a really funny idea that you guys suggested so I wanted to put that in there because it, it looked like he could fit under her skirt. While we were talking, she mentioned how some of these pieces can take months if inspiration falters or if you're unsure how to finish. A lot of these artists I talk to mention having this problem happen to them, actually. Uh, bricking one of your hard drives doesn't help either. That can slow you down. I accidentally kicked over one of my hard drives. I don't know why I put it on the floor, but it was on the floor. <laughs> I kicked it over and it like pretty much like all my data was lost. So I was really bummed out and I'm just like, you know what? That's fine. I'll just start over. <laughs> and really Dark Souls kind of reminds me a bit about that where you put in all this effort it doesn't really matter if you die you just have to start over <laughs> sometimes you just have to pick up the pieces and you can't you can't like dwell on the things that you've lost you just have to keep pushing forward one of the things that's really fascinating to me is learning what it was that propelled an artist to fame some like carson or john they find an audience through many pieces over time and others, like our next artist, Judson, spend months working on their magnum opus. So I, you know, I'll put it a PNG, put it up on Reddit, and went to sleep. And then the next morning, <laughs> I woke up and it had been upvoted like a thousand times, and Kotaku had already picked it up, this like unfinished artwork, and, and run a story about it. And the editor of Edge magazine, which is like the best gaming publication in the UK, had gotten in touch with me and was like, hey, can we print this in the next issue of the magazine? I was just like, boy, it's not done! It's not done! And I, like, uh, and, but that, all that support kicked me in the ass and got me up working on it, you know, so I, I finished it. Judson is the artist behind Laudate Solis. It's this hugely ambitious vertical illustration of Lordran that captures this staggering amount of detail, most of it being completely to scale. Scrolling down through it, you start to comprehend the beauty and complexity of Dark Souls' world design, and, of course, the amount of effort that this piece must have taken. I was working constantly. When I was, you know, I have a nine to five job, so I would get home from work, I'd make a sandwich, and I'd just sit down and work until I went to sleep for a month. Like it, it absorbed all of my time. Um, and at some point, I decided I would put a like second color texture on Sin's Fortress, and it looked good enough that I then had to do it the entire map, which like added another 40 hours of work on the project. <laughs> Interestingly, Judson says that it was the linear world of Dark Souls 2 that made him want to capture the complex, interwoven world of Dark Souls 1. At a glance, this piece instantly clicks with that world map of Dark Souls 1 that we all intuitively know from playing the game so much. Art can change your perspective. You might play Dark Souls 1 now with this newfound appreciation for the world and the relationships between areas now that you've seen Judson's piece, and that's a pretty special thing that he's captured here. But this next body of art we're going to talk about is a part of a project that goes beyond changing perspectives. It could also affect your experience with the game. It's a web app called Bloodbook. So Bloodbook is an application you play alongside with Dark Souls 2. Uh, it doesn't affect Dark Souls 2 in any way, but what it does is it gives you a goal and a method of play that's different from just invading. The goal is to do a sequence of PvP invasions with, um, with objectives. And the loose tie that holds it all together is these, these tiny snippets of story and character development. Your goal with Bloodbook, simply put, is to complete 20 PvP contracts and acquire as much gold as you can by the end of it all. Let's run through a hypothetical contract together. First, I have to retrieve it. It's buried directly in front of the flame salamander guarding this tunnel. I grab it. 
The contract tells me that I need to invade and assassinate a royal last seen in Brightstone Cove. It's also required that I hide my face with a mask or a helm. We don't want them to see me. And the contract also gives me a list of optional objectives that I can complete to acquire more gold, uh, like landing a backstab or killing the opponent with firebombs, things like that. Naturally, I put on the bell helmet and I invade. That helmet actually ends up saving me from an arrow in this clip, which I thought was pretty amazing. Um, apparently my target is sniping me from above, and he ultimately kills me because I can't get back up there, and I fail the contract. As punishment, my next contract has to be completed with the lowest camera sensitivity, and this is just one of many punishments and one of many adventures you can have. But most importantly, every page of this book has a fascinating little fragment of story to go along with it, and a piece of art to help your imagination along a little bit. It's like having a quest log for PvP, and it wouldn't be half as good without the artistry that Ty has picked up in his life. We have this community that is, in part, fueled by our artists. Ty's Blood Book is one example, and there are hundreds more that I'll never have the time to mention in one video. A lot of us, when we love something, we simply enjoy it. But in my experience, and in many others, when you love something, one of the best things you can do is create and share something with the world. Saying all this reminds me a lot of a talk I had with Cannonbreed, who is a really talented pixel artist who, when Dark Souls 2 was getting hyped up, he started creating art based on the slivers of information he'd seen. I decided it would be a cool idea that when there was only a few trailers, I'd try and recreate characters out of what I saw. Oh, the, the Undead Jailer, that guy. And I, I just thought, I want to try and recreate him in like pixel form, because that was the, the language I spoke, I guess. And I wanted to see if I could create him before anyone really saw what he looked like completely. So I just made that, and that was like one of the first few kind of Souls-related pieces I made. Alex says that the Souls community is full of people who aggressively seek out creators and their creations. And it's true, we're all forced together by the difficulty of this game and by our love for it. Canon Breed's pixel art has represented a lot of the most complex designs in Dark Souls in this simplified manner that Canon Breed says breeds even more creativity. So I, it seems like that's the purpose and the idea of uh, making these demakes is to kind of imagine what would happen if the same person with the same idea made the same game, but with a restricted medium 20 years earlier, 30 years earlier. Another guy who's done Souls demakes is a guy called Veselikov, who a lot of you are probably familiar with. Yeah, so uh, recently I did a um, Scholar of the First Sin demake. That was pretty fun. That was like a PlayStation 1 version of Scholar of the First Sin, and everyone's like, this isn't Kingsfield. Selikov has a great library of Dark Souls animations, and you should go check them out. My favorites are When I'm Gravelorden, and Rogue Warrior. Looks like it's time to go beyond death. Veselikov's jokes and his cartoons aren't the surface level jokes. They're not the ones that are like, oh, Dark Souls is so hard, ha ha ha, type of jokes that you can expect from more of the popular channels. He noticed pretty early on that making even the most niche jokes would get a really good response from the community. At the time when I made it, Dark Souls wasn't even relevant, you know, in my sort of, well, in animation circles, it was like, well, if you're doing that, no one's going to watch it. Because, you know, if you're an animator and you want to live off that or become famous or whatever, you've got to make stuff that's sort of relevant or, you know, you got to catch it while it's hot type thing. And so it was at that point, you know, I sort of decided, you know, I think you actually encouraged me a lot to say, like, hey, you should just make Dark Souls cartoons. I was like, okay, let's go with it, whatever. <laughs> Yeah, because it was like a niche that no one had really been occupying at the time. And I think everyone was finding that, whether it was through art on Tumblr, or videos about the lore, or with you it was animation, you know? No one was doing it, so they just loved it and they lapped it up, and yeah. This niche has continued to grow with your help. One of the best success stories, in my opinion, has been the work done by a really talented team over at Lordran and beyond. A group of four artists who are really talented, who banded together to create an ongoing series of webcomics set within the Souls universes. 
Their manager, a guy called Zach, talked to me briefly over email about the project. It's really exciting. He talks about how these comics explore interactions between characters who never even meet in game, allowing us to witness these new situations inspired by character traits and circumstance. Check out the links in the description afterwards and read through the story of Sieglind as she searches for her father, laugh at Jura as he protects the beasts of the hunt from Gascoigne, or imagine a story where Eileen watches in dismay as her friend Gascoigne descends into madness. This is a hugely ambitious project that I support 100%, and you can too. You can support them on Patreon, and you'll get a bunch of perks, along with the knowledge that you're supporting a project and artists who are creating something that everyone can enjoy. That's something I've noticed from being on Patreon. I only have 800 patrons, but they're making it so I can create content for hundreds of thousands of people. So, you know, even one person, even you, contributing just a little bit can make such a difference. And all of this is really made possible by you, the viewer. Whether you support these artists financially, or whether you just support them by saying, hey, I really like your stuff, keep it up. You're the fuel for their fire, and there's so much opportunity for us to come together and support and consume and enjoy being part of one of the best communities on the internet. There are so many people I wish I could fit into this video. I want to tell you about Bandygrass, who created this gorgeous little gif I commissioned that I now see across all the corners of the internet. It pops up everywhere. I want to mention Ian, who I can always rely upon for a speedy, high quality commission. There's Kali Deval, who I commissioned for the unique Demon Souls thumbnails back in the day. And there's animators like Aaron or Rice Pirate, who put out some of the funniest Dark Souls animations on the internet. But finally, the art that means the most to me, personally, is pretty simple. It's this little Vati avatar, and the Hexel style banner that I commissioned way back when from a hugely talented lady named Ital. So I hope that you go on from this video to click every artist I can possibly name in the description, and I hope you join me in celebrating all of this work that we're really lucky to set eyes upon. I've been talking a long time, so thanks guys, and also keep an eye on the Facebook Dark Souls page. Uh, the artist named Dreaded Cone, or Ty, who was featured earlier in this video, he hinted that he'll be showcasing a bunch of Dark Souls artists' work over there in the coming weeks and months, so let's get some hype going for that. And that's it. Cheers guys. Thanks for watching. Also, if you want to support the videos I make, like this one, which required me to organize seven interviews and go through hours of audio and edit together this narrative, and if you want more videos like this one, then you can click through here to learn more. And this support is by no means necessary, it's just appreciated. So, thank you for watching.